Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is April 5th, 2021. And this is part eight of my video series, Passover, Not Easter. This one is entitled, Watch With Me For One Hour. Before I get into the substance of this, I want to review what I have discussed previously several times concerning the purpose of parables and why Jesus spoke in parables. In Matthew 13, verses 34 and 35, it says this. And Matthew 13, by the way, is uh, a series of parables that Jesus told. It says, all these things Jesus said to the crowd in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, just previously in the same chapter, in verse 10, Matthew 13, 10, it says, The disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many Prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The key to hearing and seeing is to realize you have heard something from God and then asking him to tell you more. Because that's the heart that he will answer and that he will reveal himself to. The reason you have not is because you ask not, Jesus said. We should be asking him daily to reveal his word to us so that we understand his word. Now what does this mean to watch with Jesus for one hour. Let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 is the chapter that deals with what happened on the day of Passover when Jesus was crucified. And the night of Passover day, which is the 14th of Nisan, began with what's called the Last Supper. And starting in 26, verse 26 of chapter 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is what is commonly called communion. <clears throat> but again, it's one of those things that the church has not understood because it has to do it with eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus, which means to consume the word of God, consume the doctrine of God. It is spiritual. It's a spiritual thing that we do. And that 
itself is a mystery and was a parable. It's a spiritual undertaking that we all are in with respect to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And he reminded the disciples of this right before he was to be crucified. Verse 30. I'll skip 30 through 35 and then go on to 36. So right after the Last Supper, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So the first time he came back, found all the disciples sleeping, and he said, Could you not watch with me for one hour? Like all the scripture, this is a parable, and this has a prophetic meaning. What is the hour that Jesus is talking about? Well, I think it's the hour that we have entered. And I want to go to another one of the parables of Jesus. In fact, this was just before uh, what I read to you from Matthew 26. This is Matthew 25. The very first parable of, uh, of, the, of the three parables in Matthew 25. Verse 1. Oh, and by the way, Matthew 25 follows Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 is all about the signs of Jesus' second coming. So the context of this, of these parables, is with respect to the second coming of Christ. So just continuing from chapter 24, he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, that is, those who had the oil in their lamps, went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Do you know the hour? Before we get to the hour, though, 
because the purpose in my teaching is for people to be prepared, for people to have oil for this time. How do we get oil? Well, the critical scripture for that is Isaiah chapter 55. So turn to Isaiah 55 and starting in verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which would which does not satisfy. What's Isaiah talking about here? What waters is he talking about? What food is he talking about? What wine? What milk? And how do I buy it without money? One of the many hidden things in Scripture is that food often means doctrine or the word of God. Food is the word of God. That's why Jesus said that we are to eat his flesh and drink his blood, that his body is real food and that his blood is real drink. He's talking spiritually. He is the word of God. He said that if we receive him out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. He is the living water. So, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters of Christ. And he who has no money, you don't need money. You you just need a heart that seeks truth, that seeks God, that seeks righteousness. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Why do you waste your time? Why do you spend your money on things that do you no good? Listen diligently to me, Jesus, and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Chapter 5 of the book of Hebrews chastises Christians because they want only milk and not solid food. But Jesus says, delight yourselves in rich food, incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live that your soul may live. And I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. See, Jesus is speaking to the Kodeshim here. He's speaking to the overcomers. He's speaking to the holy ones and the time of their glorification. That's when the nations will come to them. The nations will run to them because they will hear that God is with you and that they have the words of life. But he's calling us now, the remnant now, to be prepared for this hour, for this particular hour. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We really have to get this into our hearts. And if the COVID scare didn't wake people up to this, then I don't know what will. But clearly the Lord's hand is in this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So right after John warns us not to love the world or the things of the world, then he says this, Children, it is the last hour. Now, do you think it was the last hour when John wrote this epistle 
almost 2,000 years ago? Have we been in the last hour for 2,000 years? I don't think so. We might say it's been a day, and there are some prophetic scriptures that talk about two days, and then on the third day, we will come into the light of the Lord. And I believe on the third day, on the third thousand years, we do come into the kingdom of God. But this doesn't say day, it says hour. Again, we're dealing with prophecy. We're dealing with a parable. Children, it is the last hour. I think that's talking about now. It was not talking about 2,000 years ago. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. There have been so many false prophets and false Christs coming into the forefront in this last year or two, many of whom have been very vocally pro-Donald Trump, pro-patriot, pro, um, pro-good things. But they do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach an antichrist doctrine because they preach an ascension or a transition from the third dimension to the fifth dimension or any number of other ways that they, they say this, based upon you achieving something through your own, your own endeavors. You know, like maybe you meditate a certain way. Uh, maybe you become a vegan and you, you don't eat meat anymore at all. Whatever it is, you'll find that all of these people who preach a New Age doctrine will have certain things you have to do in order to achieve an enlightened or Christed consciousness. But that is an Antichrist position. That's Antichrist doctrine. John goes on. Verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Holy One. Jesus is our creator. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is one with God. Jesus is God. Jesus. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Let no one who, or no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Age lasting, immortal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. This is a very important thing here. The Kodeshim, the holy ones of God, are people who do not need a teacher, who do not need an overlord, who do not need an overseer, who do not need someone telling them what to believe. We learn to hear God ourselves. We learn to see God in everything. 
We listen for his voice. We long to do only what we see our Father doing. We want to be exactly like Jesus. And now, 1 John 28 and 29 on to uh, chapter 3. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. See, these virgins, the five foolish virgins, could not stand at the coming of Christ because they were not full of oil. They had not feasted upon the rich food of Jesus. They had not filled themselves with the food of Jesus. And they were not full of oil. They were not full of the Holy Spirit. They were not ready to see him. Therefore, they shrunk from him in shame when he came. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We will see God as he is. And what does that mean? That means we will be like him. What? Like God? Like, is that what John said? Like God? You will be like God? Yes, that's what he said. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. This is a test. Do you keep on sinning? Well, does the seed of God abide in you? If you, if you fail that test, you need to humbly ask God to reveal his word to you and to plant the seed of his word in you. That is what he was telling Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. But this hour, what is this hour? Could you watch with me for one hour? Let's go to chapter um, Revelation chapter 17, verse, starting with verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. I taught a long video series on this concerning the mystery of the beast and reveal who this eighth beast is, and many things relating to that. Verse 12, And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. I believe that beast has been revealed to us. I believe he is in power right now. And I believe that 
these kings, therefore, are aligned with him now and that we are in the hour this is talking about. This is the hour. And we're going to get into what happens in this hour. Now, I have clearly revealed that the beast, the eighth head of the beast, is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is hated by the establishment. He's hated by Babylon the Great. He is hated by the cabal. They have tried to destroy him. They tried to destroy him before he uh, was inaugurated president during his entire four years. And then they cheated in order to keep him from a second term in office. But it will be seen that they have failed because he has what appears to be a mortal wound right now. But one point I want to get across here is that this, Babylon the Great is in control or appears to be in control. They have been in, in control for thousands of years and ruled our world in wickedness. And Donald Trump revealed much of that wickedness. They hate Christ. They hate Christians. But in verse 14 of Revelation 17, we see that the eighth head of the beast and the ten kings will make war on the lamb. And the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So whether or not Babylon's in control or Trump comes back into control, they're still going to make war against the lamb. So either way, we have to be prepared for that. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, that's Babylon the Great. And she's seated across the entire earth. It's a one world government, a one world religion of evil. The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. We are going to see that very soon. And that's why I have supported Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is God's anointed to do this. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Doesn't this explain to you why you've seen nothing but satanic imagery and sacrifices in all of the NFL Super Bowls? And why is it that all of the massive corporations are all against Georgia's new law to ensure voter integrity, Coca-Cola and all the major air airlines. Why would they be against voter ID? Babylon the Great is the dwelling place of demons. Every unclean spirit, every unclean bird, every unclean and detestable beast. And it's also full of sexual immorality, child sex trafficking. Satanic ritual abuse, blood drinking, slaughtering children for their blood, adrenochrome. Verse 4 of Revelation 18. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Can you believe it? 
God's people, even at the last hour, are still in Babylon the Great? Yes, they are. I know people, family members, in fact, who supported and voted for Biden. Can you believe that? How could you not see the evil that Biden and his party represent? How can you not see the treachery and the treason of many Republicans with respect to Donald Trump? Both parties have been corrupt. The entire world has been corrupted. And now God says, get out, come out of her. How long will it take for God's people to see? Jesus said, hearing they will not hear, seeing they will not see. For Babylon's sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. Isaiah used exactly these words. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her, and the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, in a single hour your judgment has come. All of the kings of the earth who stayed with Babylon, all of the kings of the earth who were made rich by Babylon, who lived in luxury with her, who indulged in her sins, they're crying. And they say, in a single hour, your judgment has come. Then we move on to another group. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo like what was on that ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. There has been a thriving slave market in this world forever, but it was kept hidden because they knew the majority of the people did not approve. They trafficked in their bodies and in their souls. The soul is in the blood. They trafficked in their blood. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste again in a single hour. So all the merchants cry. All the kings of the earth cried. And all the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? They asked. And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. A third time, in a single hour. Rejoice over her, O heaven, 
and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So you had all of these groups of people, the rich of the earth, the kings of the earth, the rich merchants, the rich shipmasters, and all those who traded on the sea, all mourning because Babylon was destroyed in an hour. But what are God's people to do? Rejoice. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your pharmacaea, your sorcery, your drugs. The whole world is drugged. The pharmaceutical cartels control so much. Look at what they were just part of in the COVID hoax that was everywhere around the entire earth. That was all a Babylonian hoax. Now, does it mean, does this mean that we're never going to have the sound of music again? That we're never going to have the building of fine houses again? That we're never going to have the milling of fine wheat again? that we're not going to have lights in our houses anymore, or we're not going to have any marriages anymore? No. Of course we're going to have those things because they are good and godly when they are done properly. But they are not going to be done in Babylon anymore because Babylon is finished. Babylon is destroyed in one hour. And that's the hour that Jesus asks us to watch in. We are to be watchful concerning this hour. Why? Because it is the hour of the second coming of Christ. Now, why is the destruction of Babylon so important? Well, it's found in the last verse of chapter 18 of Revelation. In her, in Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of Kodeshim, holy ones, and of all who have been slain on earth. Babylon is the murderer of all. Satanic government, demonic interference has led to the bloodshed of all. In her was found the blood of everyone slain on the earth. Now, interestingly, there's another place where we find this hour spoken of. Before I go there, though, think about this. What I just read from Revelation chapter 18 and the destruction of Babylon. See, we, de we have depended upon all this commerce that has been part of Babylon. And many of us have, lo have loved it. You know, we've gone out to their shows and we've gone on their va vacations and we've gone to their expensive restaurants and we've driven their expensive cars and we've gloried in the lusts of our flesh 
for the things of Babylon. And that's what John warned us about. Do not love the things of the world. So what's it going to look like when the Babylonian system falls? That is going to be very devastating to a lot of people. So you need to be prepared for that. We have to prepare our hearts for that. And it's a preparation for the coming of the Lord. So let's go to another scripture that tells us about this hour. This is the sixth church, the letter to the sixth church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You know, don't feel bad if you're not one of the super apostles or super prophets out there with with the big name and the big church and the big YouTube following or that you are doing and don't feel bad that you're not doing all kinds of great miracles in the name of God, in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus says, I know that you have but little power, little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That is the key. Revelation chapter 19 verse 12 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus, those who have the testimony of Jesus do not deny his name. And that is the spirit, the essence of prophecy. And these have kept God's word. They have continued to read his word as God has shared things with them, they've shared it with others. They have eaten God's word. Their word is written on their foreheads, in their minds. Their, the word of God is in their minds. Therefore, the word of God is done with their hands, which is exactly what God told Moses concerning the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread signifies, is a parable of having no sin and having no hypocrisy. The result of having the Word of God in your mind is that you will walk without sin and you will walk without hypocrisy. That's the whole point of it. And that's what Jesus is commending the Philadelphians for. They kept his word. They did not deny his name. Then he says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Who is the synagogue of Satan? Well, who says that they are Jews but are not? Jesus is the king of the Jews. So we who believe in Jesus are Jews by faith. So there are many, many, many Christians who say they are Jews but are not. 
In fact, they go to synagogues of Satan. Their churches are nothing but dens of Satan. How can that be? They don't teach the truth. That's how that can be. They teach a lie. And a lie is of the devil. And these Philadelphians, God is going to glorify them so that these people who were deceivers, who said they were Jews but were not, who said they were Christians but were not, who said they did the will of God but they did not, God will come and make them bow down before these overcomers, before these Kodeshim. And they will learn that God loved these outcasts. Because you have kept, listen to this, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, endure. Endure to the end and you will be saved. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Wow. That's the hour. That's the hour that we are watching in right now. And God is keeping us from it. I haven't been affected at all by COVID. Not at all. And I, I will not be affected by the fall of Babylon the Great. Because I'm out of there. I came out of her a long time ago. All of us need to come out of her. This hour of trial, Jesus says, is coming on the whole world. And it comes to try everyone who dwells on the earth. And then get this, the next verse, 11, Revelation 3, 11. I am coming soon. You know, Jesus puts that little phrase in very significant places for a purpose because he is coming soon at that hour, the hour we now live in. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. What crown is that? That's the crown of righteousness, the crown that Paul received and knew he was receiving it in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Because God himself is our inheritance. God is the inheritance of the Kodeshim. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and I will write on him my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen.